Hi, everyone, to our audience from all corners of the world. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the 15th virtual webinar hosted by America Sri Lankan Photographic Arts Society in Los Angeles, California, USA, a member of Photographic Society of America, PSA, and the International Federation of Photography of Art in France, FIEP. The objective of this webinar series is to promote environmental conservation in the context of nature photography and ecotourism. I'm your host, Medhini Ratnayaka. We are streaming live from Los Angeles, California, USA, and connecting with our panelists in Sri Lanka. This week's topic is evolution of national parks and conservation of natural resources. Today, we have a veteran personality who has chosen wildlife conservation as his career to share valuable information with us on this topic. We warmly welcome Mr. Ranjan Marasinghe, Director of Operations of the Department of Wildlife Conservation in Sri Lanka to our panel discussion. Ranjan holds an MPA and MS, Forestry and Environmental Management from University of Sri Jawadhanapur, Sri Lanka, MBA from University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka, Postgraduate Diploma on Wildlife Management from Wildlife Institute of India, LLP from Open University of Sri Lanka, and the Postgraduate Diploma in Governance from University of Sri Jawadhanapur, Sri Lanka. Ranjan is a lecturer on wildlife management at the National Wildlife Training and Research Center in Sri Lanka, and also a visiting lecturer in wildlife management at several universities, including at the Department of Zoology and Environmental Sciences at the University of Colombo. Ranjan is the author of Estimating Re Recreational value of Yale National Park and co author of Institutional Structure and Office Procedures Handbook for Wildlife Officers and Wildlife Crime Investigation and Code Procedures Handbook for Wildlife Officers and the editor of Wild Lanka International. He is the national focal point for Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wildlife Fauna and Flora, national focal point for South Asian Wildlife Enforcement Network, national focal point for South Asian Wildlife Enforcement Network and the authorized officer of the Management Authority of Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species Cities in Sri Lanka. Ranjan has been a consultant to OCTAD and a member of the Sri Lankan delegation to several international conferences on international trade in endangered wild fauna and flora. Ranjan, we warmly welcome you to our panel discussion. A very good evening to you from Sri Lankan time, and we are very privileged to have you with us here today. So I'm pretty sure our audience from all around the world is waiting to hear all the insights you're going to share with them. So take it away. Okay, thank you. I think you can see my presentation now. Yes, we yeah. can see your presentation. Okay. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, America, Sri Lanka Photographic Art Society, uh, Los Angeles, uh, especially Mr. Surya, uh, for inviting me to uh, do this presentation uh, for the society and the membership. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, in my presentation, I'm. Uh, Going to discuss about the evolution of national parks and conservation of national resources uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, past, present, and future challenges. Now, uh, why we should do conservation? So, uh, before discussing the topic, we have to clarify this thing. Now, we need to conserve the nature as it satisfies my basic needs. So every person, 
they feel that uh, we have to conserve the nature because it satisfies his own needs. Maybe food, maybe shelter. So that is one uh, reason. Uh, at the next level, uh, we need to conserve nature as I expect to satisfy my uh, needs of the tomorrow. That means I am looking at the future. So uh, for my future safety, I have to conserve the nature. Uh, at the third level, uh, we we need to conserve as we expect to satisfy our needs. That is as a whole, as a community. So there we are talking about the equity, intergenerational equity. Uh, the entire society needs to satisfy our needs. So for that reason, we are we need to conserve. At the fourth level, we need to conserve nature for the future generation. Here we are talking about the future generation and technically it is intergenerational equity we are talking about. Then uh, lastly, we need to conserve the nature for the sake of nature. So that is not for uh, that is not a personal uh, requirement, and it is an altruistic uh, motive to conserve the nature for the nature. So these are the different levels uh, or different reasons for different people to conserve the natural resource of the world. Now, if we uh, further analyze the situation, now for my benefit is at one end. So there. Are, then the next level is we are thinking about the nation. So my country, my people, my community. Uh, then at the third level, we are we focus on the entire world. We have to conserve the resources for the entire uh, 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 the nations and all the people in the world. And the fourth level, I discussed what the, uh, the conservation need is for the entire universe, including all the elements around us. So this is the continuum starting for, uh, from myself to all the elements. So the first level, it is a selfish motive. And the other end, it is altruistic motive to conserve. So if we further analyze, now this continuum starts from need-based decision making. We are focusing on the needs of the society. And it, uh, at the next level, we uh, look at the uh, natu uh, nature as a resource base, and at the, uh, the, the the far most far end, we look at that as a right-based decision-making requirement. So we are talking about the rights, rights of uh, the animals, rights of trees, rights rights of everything. And when we focus about the self selfish motive, we are looking at the resources and its use values. At the next level, we are talking about the non-use values like ecotourism and the photography that you, uh, this society is focusing on. And at the, the last level, we are focusing at the exist, existence value of the natural resources. So this is a continuum. And if we uh, look at the ideologies behind this thinking, at the selfish motive, uh, that comes from the realist uh, ideology or political ideology, and uh, the, uh, the existence, uh, the, the, the altruistic motives are backed by the green liberal uh, ideology uh, on conservation. So it's a continuum from uh, realist to green liberal. So if we analyze the time, the history, uh, we can see this need, uh, need based use value based realist approach was in the past. In historically, we were focusing on the natural resources on these grounds. Now we are focusing on green liberal, right based uh, approach, and we are focusing on the existence value of the natural resources. And if we uh, compare the, the, the wealth of nations, now the poor community, maybe nations, they are focusing on the, uh, the need-based use values and realistic uh, end of the continuum. And they have selfish motives. And the wealthy communities, so wealthy nations, they are focusing on the altruistic side of it. And the conservation is for all the entities in the universe. So this is how we look at uh, uh, the 
conservation and different ideologies, how it matches with the different levels and how the value system works and how the, the, the decision-making criteria work, it is uh, shown here. Now, if we further analyze, now here the left and right uh, is not something to, uh, uh, this is nothing uh, to do with the, the political left and right. I am referring to my sl uh, previous slides, left side and right side. And left side, we can see realist ideologies and we are focusing on use values. We are focusing on need-based uh, uh, decision-making and the view is very narrow on the natural resources. On, on my right side, uh, the ideology is green liberal ideology. And we are focusing on non-use values and existence values of the natural resources. Then we are talking about the right-based uh, approach and the view is broader compared to the left side. And in the past, we were thinking, uh, we. Uh, we're focusing on realistic ideologies, use values, need based and uh, decision making, and narrow view on the environmental resources or natural resources. And present, we are our conservation effort is polished with green liberal ideology, and we are talking about non-use or existence values of the natural systems, and the right-based approach. We are uh, looking at the rights of the animals, rights of the plants, rights of everything. Then. We are looking at the natural resources uh, with a broader view on them. But if we analyze the present situation, now nations, usually, even in the present, nation, uh, present uh, time, the developing nations focused at the left side of my slide, and the de developed nations look at the right side of the story. And if we uh, Look at the community, the poor community, look, uh, take it, uh, focuses on the right, left side, and the wealthy communities focus on the right side of my uh, slide. Then, if we uh, put the knowledge into the picture, I don't, use, I don't like to use the illiterate and illiterate. So, the not well informed segment of the community, they focus on the left side and the well-informed uh, segment of the community, uh, they look at the right side. So basically the conservation challenge, it, this dichotomy, which is existing globally among the developed and developing nations, within nations among the poor and the wealthy communities, within communities among the well-informed and not so informed categories. So this is the whole uh, reason for the challenges uh, for conservation. Now, if we uh, discuss the history of conservation and genesis of protected areas, I like to uh, share this slide. Uh, this is taken from internet. And uh, now our conservation goes back to the 246 uh, BC uh, in the history because we are, Sri Lanka is having a written history for a very uh, long time now. And when uh, Sri Lanka received the Buddhism, uh, Mehidu, uh, the, 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 the messenger sent by the Indian uh, kings. Uh, now, they taught our kings that uh, the, the forest and all these natural resources are owned by the the people and the, all the other, other other elements. So the animals and plants, they are they, they are the owners of the uh, nature, and the king is the is a is a trustee. He he is not the owner. He has to look after the, these things on behalf of the uh, the others. So now this is uh, this goes with the uh, present day liberal green liberal ideology where. Uh, if, uh, here we talk about the rights of everything. Now, everybody in the system are owners and they have equal rights. So this is the history that we are sharing. But, uh, and if you look at the conservation approach in Sri Lanka, the King Devanampiyatissa declared the world's first wildlife sanctuary 
Bihintali in 246 BC. Now that uh, protected area, wildlife sanctuary, is based on not not based on the present uh, day protected area concept, but it is more towards uh, uh, the green liberal extreme uh, kind of a uh, ideology. Then uh, there, uh, the, now the ecological harmony we were maintaining at that time was drastically changed into destructive resource exploitation by colonials when Sri Lanka came under the colonial powers. Then uh, with that, the Western concept of conservation was uh, planted in Sri Lanka and we were having game, game reserves for protection and we have protected areas for conservation. Uh, so earlier we uh, used to use the game reserves uh, for the protected areas at that time. And now we are using the term protected areas uh, which look at the uh, conservation of the natural resources. So uh, now in discussing the evolution of conservation, I'm going to discuss the uh, conservation in colonial era, then the contemporary conservation ideologies, then Sri Lanka's conservation agenda, conservation movement uh, of the public. Uh, now in the history, if you uh, see the history, the first attempt uh, to conserve uh, forests uh, was made in 1889 by a person called uh, Clark. And he uh, understood that uh, the destructive uh, economic practices uh, were not going to be uh, sustainable. And he wanted to uh, advocate the government to uh, enforce laws to protect the uh, the wild animals and the, uh, their habitats. So uh, he was not successful in uh, enforcing any law, but his successor, uh, Brown, uh, he somehow persuaded the government to pass two ordinances. One is to uh, prevent the wanton destruction of elephants, buffaloes, and other games. And uh, the, other, uh, the second uh, legislation was an ordinance to readjust re the custom duties uh, leviable on firearms and to impose an export duty on certain heights and horns. So in one hand, uh, he was trying to uh, conserve the elephants and buffaloes and their habitats. And from the other side, the, the reason for destruction, the guns and the foreign trade of uh, heights and horns, he wanted to uh, restrict. So this is the first attempt uh, in year 1889. Uh, then after that, in 90s, uh, the first uh, half of the 20th century, uh, the vast uh, areas were uh, earmarked for uh, conservation, uh, which is called Yala National Park at, uh, now and the Will Park. Those two areas were reserved for experimental and scientific, uh, sci scientific purpose. So way back in 90, uh, early part of the uh, 20th century, uh, they were talking about scientific conservation, the experiments, and things like that. In 1930, uh, there was a special committee uh, by the then government, uh, initiated by the Ministry of Agriculture and Lands, to look at the local situation and uh, provide recommendations to the government. So they urged the necessity for the protection and uh, preservation of the indigenous fauna and flora. And it gave the birth to fauna and flora protection ordinance number two of 1937. So which is, we, 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 uh, use, uh, we use the term FFPO to uh, show this, uh, to identify this legislation. And until now, it is the most powerful legislation in the country uh, when it comes to biodiversity conservation. And in 20th century, latter part of the 20th century and 20, uh, early part of the 21st century, the ideology is green liberalism. So our conservation agenda is, you know, painted with this uh, ideology and uh, the green liberalism values the earth very high. It emphasizes the importance of the plant, uh, planet being passed down to the next generation. So that is the intergenerational equity. Then natural world is the state of flux and does not seek to conserve the natural world as it is. 
now here the artificial intervention into the national systems is not uh, you know advised then seek to minimize the damages aid the regeneration of the damaged areas then green liberalism seeks e equality equity from one side and equality from the other side then freedom of the individuals uh, now if you take if you look at the existing court cases and uh, decisions now uh, human rights the individual uh, the were used as a tool to protect the, uh, the environment uh, systems so uh, the, the freedom of the individuals is given a higher priority then environmental protection is uh, given a focus and they ad ad advise reduce the threats like overconsumption and pollution so the whole uh, the message is the sustainable use of natural resources now with this idea this ideas uh, the conventions like cites which is convention uh, to uh, manage the international uh, trade of endangered species then convention of biodiversity then ramsar convention which is for wetlands then the cms for the migratory species uh, came into the picture and after that there were igos uh, international uh, non government organizations like iucn Uh, World Wildlife Fund and Traffic uh, International; those kind of uh, agencies came into the picture. So this is the uh, this is, uh, the situation that we are in now, and our conservation agenda is, uh, you know, painted or uh, influenced by the green, green liberal ideas. And if you see the Sri Lanka's conservation agenda. Uh, we have uh, several agencies uh, running the show uh, the primary one is department of wildlife conservation because uh, its mandate is to conserve the biodiversity uh, and uh, then the department of forest now it conserve forest and supply timber and non timber resources it uh, forest department looks at the consumption side of it also then coast conservation department the marine in, uh, environment protection authority and central environment authority it is uh, it is an umbrella organization providing the legal backing to all of these agencies so if we start from the uh, central environment authority uh, its objectives are to protect the protect manage and enhance the environment uh, then regulate maintain and control the quality of the environment and prevent abate and control pollution if you look at all these objectives Uh, it talks about the general uh, general environment uh, safety and talks about the uh, the pollution talks about uh, various kind of water pollution air pollution and that kind of things and looks at uh, the the monitoring or managing the industries and development uh, activities uh, to safeguard the environment and uh, they also do the environment uh, monitoring but Uh, they don't specifically work on the resource uh, natural resource uh, conservation or biodiversity conservation directly but it provides an umbrella uh, protection to all of all these areas then uh, the marine pollution con uh, authority it focuses on uh, on marine pollution and uh, it, it is basically focusing on international conventions on prevention of pollution from ships and oil pollution then the uh, bunkering oil pollution damages then harmful anti fouling systems on ships these kind of things and that agency also looks at the part of the story and it's not uh, they they are not focusing that much on uh, resource conservation but they are they are looking at the protection of uh, marine uh, environment systems then coast conservation department uh, it is a new department and uh, its uh, mandate is to have uh, to devise a coastal zone management plan and implement it and it is so, uh, only focusing on the coastal zone so all these agencies they are not directly focusing on the conservation of biodiversity or conservation of natural resources of sri lanka but there are two agencies primarily uh, giving focus on this area uh, one is the forest department uh, and uh, it, it is the oldest department uh, working on uh, forest or forest related uh, resources and uh, it was uh, uh, started in 1980 1887 uh, 
and uh, their policies were uh, the first policies uh, they devised in 1929 and uh, we have now 1995 uh, policy and we if we analyze the change in these policies we can see how the conservation ideology changed uh, from this uh, early colonial era uh, to the present day now uh, in 1929 forest policy uh, it makes uh, they were looking at the general uh, forest uh, services and uh, now they uh, and uh, most of all they were focusing on the timber harvest so uh, it uh, in 1929 policy they were talking about self supporting in timber uh, fuel wood and other essential pro uh, forest products so they were uh, looking at the need base or the, that selfish kind of uh, need of individuals to extract the resources from forests. Uh, then uh, the second objective is to provide timber and forest products, uh, both for export and the uh, in, uh, domestic market and the world market. Uh, then conserve water supply and prevent erosion and to coordinate forest operations. So basically 1992, we were focusing on extracting timber and giving uh, uh, narrow, uh, forest services like water supply and soil erosion. Then uh, in 1953 and 1970, you can't see uh, much difference in these policies, uh, but uh, the, uh, there are terms like sustainable lead of timber and other forest products. So sustainability, came, sustainability of this timber yield came into the picture in 1953 and 1970 policies. And, uh, but still, uh, primary focus is on the timber harvest. Uh, in 1980 uh, policy, uh, the basic difference I see is uh, now they were talking about the local community. So now uh, involving the local community in this timber, timber uh, the, the forest conservation uh, was given a priority in 1980. So uh, now uh, the forest conservation policy now is enriched uh, to share the benefits with the local community. Then uh, the recent one, the 1995 policy, we can see a lot of uh, new things. Now, Forest Department uh, was initially looking at the uh, timber supply for the country and the world. But uh, in 1995 policy, it's the turning point uh, where they talk about the uh, biodiversity, uh, the historical, cultural, and religious and aesthetic values of the forest. And uh, to, uh, now the other objective is to increase the tree cover and productivity of the forest to meet the needs of present and future generations. There we are talking about the uh, intergenerational equity. Then to enhance the contribution of forestry to the welfare of the rural population and strengthen the national economy and equality and economic development. So there are the equity, equality and all these uh, liber green liberal uh, ideas were incorporated in 1995 policy. So you can see that how this uh, historically the forest department's conservation approach changed. And if you take uh, the Department of Wildlife Conservation, it is also following the same thing. But from the beginning itself, the Department of Wildlife Conservation in 1937 uh, started looking at the biodiversity conservation. So, uh, but uh, in uh, during late 19th uh, century, there was no policy or wildlife related uh, document, everything was uh, uh, run by the, the legal uh, framework. <coughs> and uh, in uh, that was, uh, that was uh, because of the resource extraction and the commercial plantations by the colonials. In early 20th century, uh, the protected area uh, declaration was happening, uh, basically Yala and Vilpatu. Uh, then proclamation of fauna and flora protection ordinance number two of 1937 came into the picture and it created the department of wildlife conservation and uh, the british uh, colonials were heading uh, the department at that time and uh, that was uh, create uh, happening as a result of the impact of the social and economic changes by the colonials because if you analyze what was happening in the UK or United States at that time, uh, the conservation uh, movement was taking uh, you know, the acceleration. So uh, the same thing was happening in Sri Lanka in parallel to what was happening in uh, Great Britain. 
and late 20th century uh, we were establishing uh, new protected areas amendment of and flora protection ordinance to give special focus on elephants establishment of corridors uh, improvement of wildlife department in 1960s uh, uh, we were having uh, multi purpose large scale uh, development projects and uh, the, the focus was uh, on balancing the effect the negative effects of those uh, multi purpose development projects uh, and uh, the contemporary land use uh, practices and their impacts also uh, impacted the late 20th century uh, conservation agenda of the department of wildlife conservation now if we analyze the the conservation community or the conservation movement historically in uh, we have a uh, history of uh, environment uh, related non governmental movements uh, even uh, from 1894 in 1894 uh, some wealthy uh, group of individuals who belongs to the elites in the country formed a non governmental organization called ceylon game protection society so by looking at the name you can see that uh, their motive is to protect the game animal so the hunting was uh, was, a, was a fashion at that time and this particular agency this particular entity is uh, trying uh, was trying to manage the game uh, game hunting then they have changed its name in 1930 to ceylon game and fauna protection society now you can see uh, their uh, their their focus is now uh, including the plants and the animals both fauna and flora then in 1955 they they changed their name into wildlife protection society so now they were they were not using these terms like game or fauna and it is now wildlife as a whole and they are talking about they are focusing about uh, the entire uh, picture then in 1970 they again changed the name wildlife and nature protection society after 1970 we are now having a, a infinite number of uh, ngos con conservation related ngos and uh, individuals who are working on uh, conservation of uh, natural resources but if you look at this uh, the history of uh, conservation movement in sri lanka you can see it started from the game hunting and converted into uh, a broad based or uh, natural resource management uh, role from its beginning so uh, if we uh, now here uh, the most important thing happening uh, happening in sri lanka was the evolution of this fauna and flora protection ordinance up to now it, it, it is considered as one of the uh, powerful legislations Uh, which facilitates the conservation of biological biodiversity research in, uh, resources in sri lanka so if we uh, evaluate uh, the fauna and flora protection ordinance we can see how the sri lankan uh, conservation thinking is uh, you know evolved now Uh, this is the long title of the fauna and protect, uh, for flora protection ordinance it says an ordinance to provide for the protection and conservation of fauna and flora and their habitats for the prevention of commercial and other misuses then for the conservation of the biodiversity so uh, this long title itself talk about uh, gives a broader view on the uh, natural resource conservation so it covers not like uh, the forest ordinance uh, the forest department uh, this fauna uh, and flora protection ordinance from its beginning uh, was focusing on the conservation then uh, if you go into the details the ffpo fauna uh, and flora protection ordinance focuses on two basic things one is the ecosystem so habitats and the species level conservation so to look at the ecosystems to protect the ecosystems and the habitats of the, uh, the plants and animals uh, the protected area system was proposed then to look at the species protection there are set of protected species lists giving special protection to uh, identified uh, animals 
and plants. And in the act itself, there is a separate chapter focusing on elephants. So elephants were given a higher priority uh, from the beginning. And uh, there is another section, several sections providing uh, for the regulation of international trade. So international trade was treated as something uh, that can have negative effects on the conservation of Sri Lankan uh, biodiversity and the natural resources. So uh, if you talk about the uh, protected area system, we are having different kinds of protected areas. Strict nature. On your right side, you can see how these protected areas distributed in the country. And uh, the strict nature reserves is given the highest uh, legal uh, protection. Uh, we have several uh, few uh, strict nature reserves. Uh, in strict nature reserves, only the research work is allowed. No other human activities allowed and is strictly protected. Then at the next level, national parks, where you can visit national parks. Uh, the tourism is happening in national parks. They are uh, similar to uh, the Yellowstone or Waterton in uh, Canada or uh, United States or the Cobalt in uh, India. Then we have natural uh, nature reserves. It is similar to national parks, but uh, we don't do uh, tourism there. Then uh, to establish the connectivity, the biodiversity con connectivity, we have jungle corridors. Then we have national uh, marine national parks to protect the marine environment. And we have the recently we added a uh, new type of uh, protected area, which is called managed elephant reserves. Their ownership is now all the uh, previous uh, protected areas, the entire land uh, belongs to the, the state. So th that is state land. But in a managed elephant reserve, you can have different owners, maybe different uh, uh, government agencies, maybe private uh, individuals. But uh, those landowners need to uh, do their thing, uh, do their day-to-day -day, uh, things, uh, considering elephants as a priority. So they can't do everything they want, but their activities uh, have to be restricted. Then sanctuaries is again same kind of a situation where you have private and state-owned lands, but not like an elephant reserve where you specially focus on elephants. In sanctuaries, we focus on all the animals. Now, in a sanctuary, unprotected animals are also given a legal protection. So this is how the protected area system is established in Sri Lanka. So this protected area system looks at the ecological uh, ecosystem conservation or habitat uh, conservation. Uh, then uh, when we look at the fauna and flora uh, species level conservation, we have a list of mammals and reptiles that are not protected. We have a list of mammals and reptiles that are strictly protected. We have a list of birds that are not protected. We have a list of birds that are strictly protected. We have a list of amphibians that are not protected, list of fishes that are protected, list of invertebrates that are protected, list of plants that are protected. Now in these lists, you can see the, the, the bold color lists. Now those are negative lists. That means uh, these lists contain animals which are not protected. That means the entire, uh, all the others in that category are protected. Now for example, Reptiles, the entire reptile community is protected other than uh, the, uh, the mam mammals and reptiles listed in uh, Appendix 1. So birds are also same. There are non-protected species. All the other birds are protected. And there are amphib uh, for amphibians also, there are not protected lists and all the amphibians are protected. So this negative listing is uh, very, uh, you know, it's a very strong mechanism we can see in fauna and flora protection because if we discover a new species then automatically that species gets protection from this law so if we further analyze the fauna and flora protection now outermost uh, uh, circle talks about the international trade regulations we can see in the ffpo so it looks at the external influences uh, towards the Sri Lankan biodiversity or natural resources. Then the ecosystem conservation, there are sections to uh, conserve the ecosystem and there are uh, sections to habitat, uh, ensure the habitat conservation. 
and within that there are animals uh, the fauna uh, related uh, provisions and flora related provisions so uh, the ffpo provides uh, a very broad uh, and uh, at the same time very specific kind of protection to the entire uh, natural resource in the country uh, the only area we don't uh, the ffpo not provide in, uh, provide provided any 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 legal thing is uh, the, the climate change so for climate change uh, we can't do anything but uh, that is the only area we don't uh, include we don't have provisions in if uh, uh, then we uh, need to focus on the issues and trends now i'd like to uh, discuss on the dimensions of the the issues and to uh, take one uh, conflict the one great, uh, great conflict that we are facing human and human conflict and explain the situation there and uh, now we have uh, ecological issues now uh, our uh, eco ecological systems are low productive so our uh, systems cannot provide uh, necessities for uh, their users so if you take elephant for an example our forest our protected area system or the forest forest areas under the forest department is not capable of providing all the uh, facilities to elephants so ele elephants move into the human habitations and roam around the country so uh, greater proportion of sri lanka is facilities uh, are not uh, you know adequate in uh, protected areas the, and then there are some uh, you know some of the species are growing uh, at uh, you know on uh, the uh, breaking the ecological balances because uh, the uh, birds like peacocks then macaques then giant squirrels they they were you know their populations are increasing uh, that is again because of the human intervention but uh, that is those are ecological issues uh, then there are uh, development agenda related issues one is habitat fragmentation uh, so because of the development uh, the habitat is fragmenting now then uh, because of the habitat uh, fragmentation genetic erosion is happening because isolated populations are you know restricted into islands of the protected area so there are no uh, you know mixing with genetics mixing genetics so that erosion is happening so now even though people look at leopards and the white pythons as iconic you know animals but uh, it from one side it shows that uh, inbreeding is happening so it is not a positive sign uh, then land clearance uh, for development project is happening and for human habitations Then the pollution is so happening the change of uh, natural phenomena for development purposes now sometimes uh, the irrigation systems are you know established uh, and it alters the changes in water table and uh, the entire system uh, ecological system is changing so uh, the team that sometimes uh, most of the time negatively impact on the uh, the natural resource and the wildlife and uh, associated species then uh, there are resource use conflicts now if you take uh, tourism for an example it's very innocent area where you go to see national parks and come back only you know take photographs and nothing is taken away from the protected area but uh, but uh, so most of the time over visitation creates issues now if you take jala national park for an example it's blamed for over visitation Uh, then poaching is happening uh, then illegal logging uh, illegal extraction of natural resources those are resource use conflicts because people uh, want to use resources in surrounding areas but the country want to stop that so that conflict is there then ideological uh, ideology related uh, issues are also there now conservation agenda is outshadowed with animal right activism now 
conservation is it's a man it's something to do with management so you uh, in conservation agenda we, we have to look at the ecosystems uh, we have to look at species we have to look at uh, uh, the resources in a broad way and our management uh, strategies should uh, have the same understanding but Uh, this conservation is uh, now mixed with animal rights and where you focus on individuals people tend to uh, name animals and you know when you name an animal then it, you take that that outside uh, out of the, uh, the 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 entire community and treat it different so uh, that is an ideological mismatch they are focusing on individuals rather than entire species conservation people yeah that is what i have explained so focusing on individual species so now most of the time department of wildlife conservation has to you know look after injured any uh, in, injured animals you know take uh, uh, injured animals from uh, wherever they are and treat them and release back to them so those are individually focused uh, attempts and it is nothing it is not going to help the the broad level conservation agenda uh, that is one issue then the, the technology is also creating an issue they create new offenses now uh, the one and four protection ordinance never thought of uh, uh, this uh, handling the, the technology related the wildlife offenses like you know uh, international uh, smuggling of wild elephant wild uh, wildlife specimens using uh, social media like facebook and you know that kind of uh, technology so so uh, that is one issue then criminals with technology uh, is very difficult to control so that is also uh, one issue then uh, there is a virtual Ill- illegal markets uh, it's very difficult to detect so the, uh, those are the new uh, issues that we are having technology related issues Uh, now if i take uh, the biggest problem we are having the human elephant conflict and uh, analyze it uh, then this is the situation now if you take uh, from 2010 to 2019 uh, the human deaths and elephant deaths are increasing uh, if you closely look at it you, you can see the cyclic uh, pattern uh, but that cyclic pattern also having a increasing trend so that we can generally say that human elephant conflict is increasing and uh, in the graph in the uh, bottom part of the slide it shows uh, the reason for elephant deaths now uh, we can see that gunshots were reduced from uh, 2010 to 2014 and increasing again so uh, that means uh, then uh, the jaw bombs the new kind of uh, it's a explosive uh, used to kill uh, elephant so it is increasing from uh, 2010 to 2019 so all these at, uh, reasons for elephant deaths are man uh, intentional killing so that that means the all the elephants are dying because of human uh, activity so uh, this thing uh, we don't now if we uh, evaluate this trend with the a gross domestic uh, product of the sri lanka at constant level now there is uh, this increasing elephant deaths and the the gdp trend is uh, correlating so uh, in uh, 2010 uh, the gross domestic product product of sri lanka was 52 uh, 52.52 us dollar, dollar billions and it, it is now in 2010 87 uh, you saw the billions so with the chain uh, of gdp that means when increasing uh, economic activities uh, causes the uh, is one reason for human elephant death so uh, that is the relationship between the development and the, uh, the negative impact of development towards uh, conservation issues now as a result we have to pay the compensation now this is the trend we uh, from 2010 we uh, increased the, the compensation payment for uh, elephant uh, related damages four times uh, when it come uh, in, uh, in 2019 so 2010 it was 38 million and now it is 130 plus some uh, millions of 
So it is four times, more than four times. Uh, then if you see what is the issue behind this uh, human elephant conflict, um, now the cause is by many other entities on which wildlife has no control. Now this development is done by different other entities, the land uh, clearing and uh, changing the land use pattern is not done by the department and the wildlife conservation has no control, but the effect is the subject of development of wildlife conservation. So the human element conflict, which is the effect of this uh, intervention, is the subject of DW. So we have a problem which we cannot control. Now, as I said earlier, the intrinsic low net pr primary production of the habitat is also a contributor because elephants are not having adequate food inside uh, our protected areas. Uh, and on the other side, the elephant uh, needs are also jumbo in size. They need uh, low, uh, big area, a lot of food, and their social activities require a lot of space. Then uh, from the opposite side, the needs of the people are ever increasing, the populations are increasing. So we have to have we have to open up new areas for the community to live. So that is also increasing. Uh, then physical involvement of human elephant conflict is an issue now uh, in the Department of Wildlife Conservation. We have issued effective card uh, around thousand uh, individuals, uh, and uh, we have to operate uh, both inside and outside the protected area. So, if you uh, look at the land to man ratio, uh, one officer has to look after 66 square kilometers, so 17,000 hectares, which is an impossible task. Uh, if we put it in a different way, the one officer has to take care of more than five elephants because we have uh, almost uh, 5,000, uh, more than 5,000 elephants. So that means one officer has to take care of five elephants for the entire day. So it's a very difficult task. And uh, now, if I explain uh, this complexity, this is a very, you know, uh, I'm using this slide to explain our situation. Now, uh, we have uh, developers, so uh, development agencies, so investors from one side, and we have the Department of Wildlife Conservation and other conservation related uh, agencies on the opposite side. And uh, these uh, development uh, agencies or developers or investors, they promise to eradicate poverty, which is a requirement of the country. And uh, the general public or the poor people, they welcome them. Thank you. They say always thank you, sir, because uh, that is their need. Because they are poor, they want to uh, eradicate poverty. And the community, entire community as a country, they also welcome the development because they we need development. And they are, they are to develop the and their next thing, uh, thing is their projects, and they they ask us to approve their projects, and then we create the, uh, this thing corridors and buffer zones, ecosystems. You can't damage this and that and all, and you have to restrict into this area, that area, and all the restrictions are imposed. So they ask us to go to hell because with those conditions, they can't uh, have their projects running. So uh, and. Uh, uh, then the community also blaming us because uh, always the conservationists are uh, blamed for, uh, you know, they treated as uh, development blockers, so they are negative uh, thinkers or something. Uh, then the general public also, the poor, poor community also looks in the negative way. And uh, as a country, we have to, we can't destroy the economy and we have to balance the thing and we have to allow some of these activities. So. Uh, the developers are, or the investors are provided the priority. As a result, uh, damages are happening. Uh, the elephants are dying, or you know, negative impacts are you know occurring. Then all these people, including the investors and the, the poor people and the others, they are shouting against us, asking us to save animals, which uh, created by them. And when animals are damaging uh, the, uh, the uh, vulnerable communities, they also ask for compensation. So we have to provide the compensation and they ask us to translocate those problem-causing elephants uh, or uh, animals. 
Then when we try to do translocation, of course, when we pay, uh, pay compensation, nobody uh, blames us. But when if we try to translocate uh, animals, then uh, the conservation community uh, is uh, asking us not to do that. So we are in a very peculiar situation where we have to take out the chick without breaking the egg. So this is the uh, situation that we are facing, uh, that all the uh, conservation agencies are facing at the moment. So it's we can't blame anybody because everybody looks at their uh, needs and we have to balance these things. So balancing is a, a very difficult task. So this is the complex situation that we are having today. So uh, if I explain the strategies that we are uh, trying to uh, stage uh, in the national policy, uh, the organization of uh, the Department of Wildlife Conservation and the uh, type of programs we are using now, uh, we have our national wildlife policy uh, in 1990 uh, and focus was, that is the last policy, the recent one, and the focus was you are not strict protection. Then uh, in 1993, the title of FFU and ordinance, uh, based on the, the 1990 policy, we changed the title of the Fauna and Protection Ordinance in 1993. And it, now it is looking at uh, the, the broadly on the natural resource conservation, we're basically focusing on biodiversity conservation. And uh, uh, 2009 policy is know, the difference between 1990 policy and 2000 policy is that uh, it, it talks about the, uh, the human dimension, you know, uh, participatory kind of uh, protection is uh, given a priority. So uh, it talks about the maintenance of ecological processes, manage, manage all components, genetic diversity, uh, sustainable use and equitable sharing of benefits, uh, conserve, conserve native and endemic species, encourage the development of biological depo repositories, then encourage private sector and communities to join as a full partner in conservation. Those are the new uh, thing, uh, things that we added into wildlife policy. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, it talks about the law enforcement and scientific management from one side. And we have to sustainably use the national park services, the park services for generation, uh, for generating the revenues for the economy. And uh, we have to encourage the people's participation in conservation. So cons participatory conservation, revenue generation, and law enforcement and scientific management are the basic ingredients in this policy. So if I put our strategy now, the wildlife conservation has four main areas, protection and law enforcement, promote research, then biodiversity conservation, then encourage participatory conservation are the basic four areas. Then uh, in biodiversity conservation, we are uh, looking at manage all uh, components of genetic diversity, then conserve native and endemic species and their habitats, then maintain ecological processes and life sustaining systems. Uh, to promote the research, we are looking at encouraging the development of biological repositories, then education, uh, in pro uh, protection and law enforcement, we are trying to improve the advocacy capacity and the intelligence capacity, patrolling capacity and crime investigation capacity. Uh, then uh, in encourage participatory conservation, we are moving towards working with the private sector, then community-based uh, conservation, then sustainable use and equitable sharing of benefits. Uh, there, we are focusing on uh, wildlife tourism because that uh, we can earn a lot of revenue out of uh, using this uh, wildlife uh, tourism uh, opportunities. And we can share that with the community through the community outreach program. And we are con uh, spending a con considerable amount of money uh, to develop the surrounding, uh, the economic uh, level of the impact zone uh, of national parks. So, uh, so that is, uh, this picture gives uh, the entire uh, wildlife conservation approach that we are practicing today. And those are some of the things now we see the services management and uh, whatever the money that we uh, gain from uh, tourism is channeling back to the community and to the wildlife conservation. 
then those are the resources that we ha have to use uh, in uh, uh, wildlife related tourism because if you see on the left side top we have uh, the biggest animal in the land elephant in sri lanka and within a matter of hours you can see the biggest uh, mammal in this uh, sea the blue whale uh, so sri lanka is blessed with all these uh, diverse uh, wildlife resources so we can use that for the generation then uh, elephant conservation is given a priority and we have a human elephant country uh, mitigation policy and at the moment we we have uh, completed 71% of percent of the the implementation successfully and still we have the problem and we are constructing and managing a uh, electric fence network in the country we are coloring uh, some herds in the of elephants and monitoring the movement and we are now trying to in, uh, explore the innovations and we are working with the you know uh, innovate commission of uh, innovators uh, to give the young and uh, old innovators to put their effort on wildlife conservation uh, then work with the corporate and the community uh, to mitigate the human elephant conflict activities at various levels so those are the things happening in uh, uh, elephant conservation area so we are incorporating new technologies in uh, law enforcement activities and at the same time we are linking with the outside world and we are working uh, regionally we are working uh, with south asian wildlife enforcement network to share information and uh, know how and the experiences uh, to enrich our wildlife conservation effort and internationally we are we are uh, working we are party to convention like cites and ramsa and uh, cms so for all three conventions uh, department of wildlife conservation is the focal point so we are contributing at the international level also uh, then uh, we are developing our ad advocacy capacity building on law enforcement and wildlife health we are focusing on health uh, wildlife health monitor program translocation of elephants and other animals this is surveillance rescue activities conducting post mortems and coordination of convention for migratory species this is happening uh, under the wildlife health uh, arm of the department uh then the research and training is also uh, uh focus area in the department we are conducting we are promoting the research culture uh, culture in the department department officers are promote uh, you know encouraged to do research work and uh, we implement capacity building program for them and we are having uh, new uh, research work happening in department genetic studies on plants animals and we are trying to fingerprint uh, fauna and flora protected fauna and flora protection species uh, fauna and flora species in the fauna and flora protection ordinance and uh, uh, we have uh, we are annually conducting a wildlife symposium to de disseminate our findings and uh, allow the outside researchers to uh, do their uh, you know present their findings in in our premises because we can uh, we wanted to uh, gather all this knowledge and make a repository to use in management so it is annually happening unfortunately this year because of the covid 19 issue we did uh, uh, stage this one uh, but uh, parallelly we are publishing a journal and uh, that is happening so those are the issues and uh, this is a, a journal publish uh, four issues per annum and from uh, 2006 we are continuing Uh, until now and now there are growing demand and uh, maybe we, we will be able to have many other issues uh, more than four issues per annum uh, in coming years because uh, the demand is now high for this uh, journal so if we uh, look at the way forward and future needs uh, those are you know at very top level now i feel we need a major program on habitat enrichment aiming at increasing the productivity of the system to cater to the needs of the habitat users now at the moment we have habitat enrich 
human programs and invasive species management activities but uh, the way we are doing is not uh, you know adequate to cater to the needs so we have to uh, i think rethink about the procedures that we are following and we we maybe uh, we have to uh, find out new ways of doing this to increase the productivity of the natural uh, the systems that we are having to cater to the needs of the habitat users then uh, we may be needing a strategy to control populations of the disproportionately growing species now some species are growing disproportionately so uh, as a country which is you know uh, developed on buddhist philosophy or the hindu buddhism and uh, we we can't practice uh, you know killing uh, mass killing or technically we can't uh, do culling operations uh, for this kind of species but we have to find a way uh, to address this issue control population of some of these species uh, which are causing issues then safeguarding the existing pa network and enrich the same because new areas are difficult to find and even if they are available it's infeasible to conserve because the demand for land is in, ever increasing and demand for uh, these resources for development is again increasing so uh, we don't think that i don't think personally that we will be able to expand the protected area network but uh, because of that we have to enrich the the capacity of these protected areas to cater to the needs then uh, we need to have a program to handle the genetic erosion among the endangered species now because of the uh, habitat fragmentation and uh, isolation of uh, the protected areas so island uh, into islands of uh, protected areas uh, the mixing up uh, mixing of uh, herds is not you know it's now uh, not happening so uh, for some species uh, this may be an issue so we need to have a program to look at this and uh, eliminate this genetic erosion among the endangered species at least for few then uh, diversion of tourism inflows to under visited areas to minimize impacts and work with the tourism industry to shift into low number high income industry now uh, the for example the yala and udavalava are now visited sometimes what uh, is is also visited and people are blaming uh, the department for loving that but we can't uh, stop uh, that also because country needs uh, tourism revenue uh, so uh, to address that issue maybe at, as a beginning we have to divert some of the tourism traffic into under visited areas and uh, di uh, diversify the, the the market or at the same time work with the tourism industry to shift into low number high income industry at the moment we are we try to increase the number of tourists visiting sri lanka but rather than that we need to focus on uh, cutting down the number but uh, attracting the high end uh, kind of uh, guests uh, then uh, convert the traditional law enforcement approaches into a technological based approach because now technology uh, creates new offenses which cannot be addressed by the traditional law enforcement act approach so uh, we need to have a, a very technical or technologically sound law enforcement approach i don't know what kind of an approach that we have to have but we have to find out a new new uh, mechanism new way then change the primary focus of the conservation education programs toward educating the activity uh, activists now in the past we were focusing all our conservation education efforts towards school children general public and the government officers as a result i think now the poaching is not happening as what we experienced in the past because uh, everybody is educated about the conservation of uh, the importance of conserving conserving wildlife resources and people are reluctant to kill uh, kill animals Uh, whatever happening in elephant cases is was unavoidable uh, but uh, generally people are very concerned about conservation uh, but the thing is now with that uh, now 
we need to work with the activists because if we educate the activists uh, with the proper conservation uh, you know uh, theories and understanding if we then we can use them uh, to address most of these issues because conservation is not an individual uh, responsibility or department of wildlife conservation's responsibility or forest department responsibility it is a responsibility of all of us it is a collective responsibility of the entire nation so uh, to move towards that end active uh, environment activists are playing a role at the moment they are working in different areas and their efforts are scattered and they are not synergistic so our if we focus more conservation education uh, programs towards these uh, individuals and agencies then we can have a very focused conservation agenda uh, and we can promote that with them and since they are having no attachments they can work freely and they can do a better service to the conservation of natural resources of sri lanka so thank you thank you very much uh, mr marasinghe if we can go back to our next screen that would be great so i know you are taking out oh, there you go if you can uh, stop sharing the screen we can go back to our panel screen now Okay, hold on. Right. Thank you. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank you because it's it was a wonderful uh, presentation with lots of insight into it. Um, uh, that one slide uh, with that visual about the challenges that you are encountering was a great visual. Uh, I love that one. I think that gave the, a really good picture to everyone who is watching this about the challenges that we are facing in Sri Lanka with conservation. So um, I know that you discussed in detail about the challenges. Let's talk about uh, your viewpoint. Um, and summarize what should be the role of the conservation community in order to successfully achieve conservation goals in Sri Lanka. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Yes, regarding this, uh, I have a little bit, uh, you can say it is a radical view, uh, because now, uh, in any part of the world, when conservation is talk about conservation, they always uh, blame the uh, the governments, you know, because governments are uh, they are pushing forward the, the development programs, and development programs are having negative impact on conservation. Uh, so uh, we conservationists always look at uh, the development as a negative kind of a thing. So uh, general public, uh, they are the people who create this voice and, you know, take even us from, uh, you know, uh, when we were, you know, not doing our work, our job properly, they are pushing us towards the, you know, the objectives of conservation. So uh, the general public or the conservation movement, but, you know, uh, why to, uh, you know, manage the negative impacts or the stop the negative impacts of development, uh, we have to help the, uh, the development agencies to find out, uh, you know, staging their development program or development agenda in a sustainable or the uh, environment friendly or conservation friendly way. So that we are not doing. So uh, it's the right time for the conservation movement to uh, take up this uh, topic and you know uh, rather than uh, expanding the gap between developers and conservation uh, you know narrow down that gap and have a dialogue with them and take them also into the uh, this thing so now we, we were we were working with the private sector for last uh, five six years now and the private sector they are doing uh, CSR projects in conservation areas uh, to do, uh, you know, habitat enrichment activities or invasive species eradication. But I can see those companies are very, uh, now 
in the beginning they were coming to our premises asking csr something maybe they are having a business agenda there but after some time they convert into conservationists so they were now becoming better conservation conservationists than us so rather than blaming uh, the, the the development agencies what we can do is the conservation movement can uh, can you know bridge the gap and join hands with them and uh, helping them to do their job without disturbing the uh, the uh, natural resource stock so i think everybody is looking at the positive side of it you know the developers are they 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 want to develop the country and they want to make country a happier place to live and we also uh, want to do the same thing so th- there is no difference so but only thing is opinions are different and they we look at uh, the same uh, thing uh, look at differently on the same thing so what we can do is to merge these two areas and work uh, together so together we can do the conservation otherwise it's impossible because as i said earlier the conservation is not a individual responsibility it's a collective and uh, the collective means all these elements need to be you know in one team so that's my uh, idea thank you very much for sharing your view point on that mr marasinghe so um as we wrap up this panel discussion what is your final message to the general public who's viewing this from all around the world Uh, yes now general uh, i was discussing now uh, in my the second slide i think uh, people uh, when we are in a group we uh, look at conservation in a very you know altruistic way we talk about uh, the rights of everybody but uh, in the same community uh, we were you, you know sometimes uh, focusing on the uh, the selfish motive also now even in a developed country there are some segments of the society who are looking at uh, the selfish kind of uh, requirements on conservation uh, compared to the uh, the altruistic kind of uh, conservation motive so it's happening everywhere so we have the community we as a uh, you know responsible citizens we have to uh, understand this and do our bit to conserve rather than others uh, rather than waiting for others to do the conservation because it's a collect uh, again i am stressing this point it is a collective responsibility and individuals we have to do our part our bit for the uh, for the world thank you mr mara singh and i really want to take this opportunity and let, let you know that we are truly grateful for your contribution towards our panel discussion we had a very insightful day with you today so thank you so much for that and for our audience uh, who joined us from all around the globe today well, thank you so much for joining us you guys have been truly amazing throughout this panel discussion series and I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon so until then enjoy and stay safe thank you yes, stay safe thank you thank you very much stay safe